My name is Jerry Davis. I'm the Associate Dean for Business and Impact at the Ross School of Business at the University of Michigan. I also have courtesy appointments elsewhere, particularly in sociology. And my role as uh, Business and Impact Dean is to try to elevate the research conversation about the place of business in society and find ways to connect our faculty's research to practice out there in the world. People don't always realize this about business schools. If you're not from a business school, you might think that we're studying stenography or bookkeeping or something like that. But it turns out that business schools are very research focused. They're filled with social scientists who are doing basic social science research on questions like inequality, um, racism in rentals, uh, all kinds of important topics, access to healthcare uh, and so on. And so there's a lot of really good basic research being done in business schools. And there has not traditionally been much of a mechanism for the work to get from the journal articles and out there into the world. The first 25 years of my career, I was definitely a perpetrator of this system. So I published almost exclusively in academic journals. I published uh, with university presses. And really the audience for my work was other academics that looked just like me because that's what we get promoted for, that's how we get evaluated, that's how we get famous in our own field. I got to this point in my research where I was finding these things about the evolution of the corporation and its effect on society that I really thought the world needed to know more about but I didn't really have a way to do that. I could publish in the most high visibility journal in my field, and there was basically zero chance that that was gonna get out into the world and influence policy or practice. One thing that I tried that I was very happy with is the conversation. So this is a uh, nonprofit that publishes essentially op-eds by academics uh, like us. And it's published under a Creative Commons license, which means they publish it originally, but anyone else can republish it for free as long as it's word for word identical and they link back to the original article. And this turned out to be a great way to reach a broad audience. I wrote one piece about uh, the boycott of NRA affiliated businesses that came out right after the Parkland shooting. About three dozen companies were listed on a website, including Delta Airlines and Hertz Rent-A-Car and uh, Dick's Sporting Goods and others. Uh, and this website said, hey, these folks have special deals for NRA members. Maybe we should boycott them. And within two days, two dozen of those companies had abandoned their ties with the NRA. That had never happened before. So I wrote a quick piece about it. it took me about four hours one afternoon to write. The editor at the conversation uh, made it comprehensible and, and easy enough to read. I went through his edits, and within seven days, it got 35,000 reads, and I got six calls from different news outlets, newspapers, PBS NewsHour, uh, NPR, uh, various newspapers who wanted to follow up uh, to learn why are boycotts different today. Well, that was gratifying. 35,000 reads in a week. That's more reads than everything I've ever published before put together as far as I can tell. It's very different to write in plain English. Uh, in fact, I've discovered as an academic it is easy to write for other academics. The obscure terminology and talking about unobserved heterogeneity and regression to the mean, the things that we say as, as our tools of the trade come very naturally. It it's, can be a bit of a struggle to try to write in plain English. But when you do, then you can have this thoughtful dialogue with people. You can go back home uh, to visit your family in, on Thanksgiving and tell them what you do, and they understand it. <laughs> so, so there really is a benefit for learning how to address the broad public. Once you get into the contact list for a journalist, other journalists looking for experts say, oh, this person seems to know something about contemporary boycotts and social media or why are companies facing new forms of activism. And so you kind of get into the regular rotation. So if that's something that you want to do, if you want to be 
more of a public facing intellectual to get your research ideas out there, this is a pretty good way to do it. I would say if I were advising a junior faculty member, a recently tenured person who wanted to get the word out, I would say find something to write for the conversation or a similar outlet and journalists follow that, they will recognize your expertise and maybe follow up about that. And it establishes a kind of uh, a, a breadcrumb trail of your work so that people out there in the world can find it. So let me make the cynical case for writing for the conversation. Academics get evaluated based on counts of publications and number of citations, at least as a first cut. And it turns out that the conversation is really good at getting people to read your underlying research. Academics also are strapped for time. We might imagine that senior faculty are receiving journals in the mail and reading every article. That can't happen. In my own field of management, there are 200 journals listed in the web of science, and between them they publish 10,000 articles a year. It is really hard to get noticed in a world that looks like that. But if you have an original take or a fresh set of observations that you think really merit some attention, write something for the conversation. Academics read it too, in addition to reporters and, and normal old people. Uh, and the academics are gonna click through and read your original research and, and say, hmm, I love your regressions, or what a great set of findings, or I wanna contact the author and find out more. So it's really almost like a trailer for the movie. You've got the conversation as the two minute version of what you're trying to get across to people, but then you can uh, drive people, other academics, to finding your original work. So why would younger scholars want to participate in the fellowship program? I can think of a couple of good reasons. We are trained to write for each other. Uh, we are trained to write in our own arcane, peculiar language that we all understand. It's full of shortcuts, but not everybody gets our jokes. So part of the great thing about the fellowship program is that you can get training in how to write in plain English, get feedback on how to do that. This is not something that our colleagues are gonna do for us because most of them aren't good at it either. And it's not really something that communications offices on their own necessarily know how to do. It's not really their job to train us how to write in plain English. And the fellowship program can do that.